Wow, every time I do this, I get goosebumps. This presentation may prove damaging to the comfort of closely held presuppositions. The thing you need to discover is that every number, every place name, every detail in those 66 books is there by deliberate design. And that's something you need to discover for yourself. Because if once you discover that, it changes your perspective in regarding the integrity of the whole. Not just in broad brush sense, in a very detailed way. Are there hidden messages in the Bible? And uh, that is uh, mentioned several places. One way is in Proverbs 25 too. It's the glory of God to conceal a thing and the duty or honor of kings to find them out. So I'm going to show you some of those things. Now Enoch's an interesting guy. We know quite a bit about Enoch, strangely enough. When he was 65 years old, something happened in his life which caused him from that day on to walk with God, whatever that means. Okay? What happened there? Something else you need to understand, the flood of Noah did not come as a surprise. The flood of Noah was preached on for four generations. And Enoch was told that as long as his newly born son is alive, the judgment of that flood would be withheld. And he, that's why he named him Methuselah. As you analyze that word in the Hebrew, it comes from a root, muth, which means his death. It occurs 125 times in the Old Testament. And the verb shalak, which means to send forth, to bring or send forth. The name Methuselah actually means, from the roots, his death shall bring. Now what's interesting about this is, when you get to Genesis chapter 5, we tend to sort of skip over it. Genesis 1 and 2, the creation, that's great stuff. Genesis 3 is the seed plot for the whole Bible. Genesis 4, the murder, and so forth. And Genesis 6 on is the flood of Noah. Gen Genesis 5 is one of those chapters you have a tendency to skip over. I mean, what is it? It's just a genealogy of ten guys, okay? Adam, Seth, Enosh, Kenan, Mahalalel, Yared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. The problem with Genesis 5 is that it's not translated for you. We, most of us are operating from an English translation. In this case, those names are transliterated. The meaning isn't there. It's an approximation of how they pronounced it. And so that we, we, we don't know how to deal with it. See, what do names mean? My legal name is Charles. What does that mean? Nobody knows. It's been lost. People have different conjectures, but no one's quite sure. Many of us in this room probably have names that were just given to us by parents because it appealed to them at the time doesn't necessarily carry significance. But in Hebrew, it's a whole other thing. Many of you may not realize that Hebrew is the only language that's semimic, not just phonetic. Most alphabets are phonetic. They, they, they lend insight as to how you pronounce a word. Hebrew is unique in that the original Hebrew, the Paleo-Hebrew, symbolized a concept, not just a sound, a meaning. Okay, so you've been with me so far. We have a genealogy here then of ten people. Adam, Seth, Enosh, Kenan, Mahalalel, Yared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. That's, let's not transliterate it, let's translate it. What do those names mean? Well, Adam means man. Seth means appointed. Enosh means mortal. Kenan means sorrow. Mahalalel means the blessed God. Yared means shall come down. Enoch, teaching. Methuselah, his death shall bring. Lamech, the despairing. And Noah, comfort or rest. Man's appointed mortal sorrow. But the blessed God shall come down, teaching that his death shall bring. Whose death? God's death. Man is appointed mortal sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down, teaching that his death shall bring the despairing comfort or rest. Wow, every time I do this, I get goosebumps. Now there's no way, this has several implications. There's no way you'll ever convince me that a group of Jewish rabbis conspired to hide a summary of the New Testament Christian gospel in a genealogy 
In the Torah? No way. One of the Kabbalists of the 16th century, Rabbi Moses Codevera, pointed out, he recorded that the secrets of the Torah are revealed in the skipping of the letters. And this is one of the early allusions that caused scholars to start looking at this, where they've rediscovered things that were known to the early Kabbalists. And one of the many different forms, perhaps the least interesting of all the forms, but the one that's most popular today, is the equidistant letter sequence. What do I mean by that? Well, here's just a candidate sentence I've thrown on the screen to make a point. Rips is one of the, uh, the scientists in this area. Rips explained that each code is a case of adding every fourth letter to form a word. Now, if you take every fourth letter of this sample sentence, um, and you take every fourth letter, it spells out another message. Read the code. Now, this is just an example to demonstrate what a equidistant letter sequence of four could contain. It's possible to, con to put a message inside another message by dealing with an equidistant letter sequence. And uh, so... Uh, one of the Kabbalistic discoveries that a guy by the name of Weissmandel discovered after World War I, between World, he lived between World War I and World War II, uh, and he uh, rediscovered something the Kabbalists had uh, dealt with. Uh, the, uh, if you, the word Torah is four letters in Hebrew, the equivalent of what we would call a T, O, R, and H, a Tau, Vav, Resh, and He. And if you go to the first Tau, and uh, you count 49 letters, seven squared, you get to a vav. You again count 49 letters, you get to a resh. And you count another 49 letters, and you get a hey. And that happens to spell Torah. Bear in mind, they, as I say, they, they, we write backwards compared to them, but you get the idea. Okay, so um, you say, well, gee, uh, that's cute. Could be just an accident of circumstance. Yes, it could, I suppose. Um, let's take a look at Exodus. Same thing happens. You go to the first how. Count 49 letters, you get a vav. Count 49 letters, you get a resh. For, count 49 letters, you get a hey. And again, you spell Torah. Now, for it to happen twice that way starts to suggest somebody did it on purpose. Trying to do something like that on purpose turns out, by the way, to be far more difficult than it looks at first. Well, you go to, Ex you go to Leviticus, and nothing happens. You feel a sense of relief, probably. If you go to Numbers, the same thing happens, but with a switch. It is spelled backwards. You go to Deuteronomy, the same equivalent thing happens backwards. And well, you, should, you take another look at Leviticus, and you, do, you don't use 49, you use 7. You discover at intervals of 7, you have the name of God, the, the yad heh vav -Hey. Now you stand back from this whole thing. In Exodus and Levi Genesis, it goes forward. In Numbers and Deuteronomy, it goes backwards. And the suggestion the Kabbalists will tell you is that the Torah always points to yad heh vav -Heh. So the one thing you can't deny here is the evidence of design. Somebody designed this package. And the more you study this package, the more you find laced all through it are evidences of very skillful design. And that's something that, uh, in my opinion, opinion we, we owe a debt to the Kabbalists for because they're the ones that really uh, reveal this to us. And why you say, why 49? Well, of course, it's the square of seven, and there's the counting of the Omar in the Hebrew uh, uh, calendar. Uh, the uh, Rabbi Hirsch said that the, the, uh, the, the, Jew, the Jews' catechism is his calendar. Feast of first fruits, first of weeks, and so forth. Uh, also, there's the prophetic genealogy in the book of Ruth. In Genesis 38, Judah and Tamar give birth to Perez and Zarak. Boaz descended from Perez. Uh, Boaz married Ruth, had a son named Obed. Obed had a son, Jesse, and the father of David. In Genesis 38, this is Genesis 38, in the days of Moses, these names are encrypted at 49 letter intervals in chronological order. Bear in mind, in the book of Ruth, which is the time of the judges, it mentions Boaz, Ruth, Obed, Jesse, David. Fine. But that's not even until Samuel. You haven't got to the monarchy yet. But go back to the books of Moses, in Genesis 38, you can find the three letters that make up the name of Boaz at 49 letter intervals. You, you continue the 49 letter intervals, you find you have Ruth in 49 letter intervals. Continuing in that passage, 49 letter intervals, you have Obed, 
and then you have Yishe or Jesse, as we would call it, and then you have, at 49 letter intervals, the name of David. So what you have here is Boaz, Ruth, Obed, Jesse, David, each encrypted with an interval of 49, in chronological order. Now, the cynics will say, well, that's just all just an accident of statistical circumstance. I don't think so. And I want to talk a little bit about sevens in the Bible. And uh, they occur in over 600 passages. I probably should have said 700. <laughs> uh, some are very overt. Some are structural. You really have to, look, and some of them are even hidden. But the, the sevens are everywhere. In fact, there's a discovery that I want to touch on about called the heptatic structure uh, of the, the, the uh, Bible. I want you to uh, imagine a challenge. Imagine yourself being assigned in that classroom context with a blank sheet of paper. And what I want you to imagine, you don't have to literally do it, but I want you in your mind's eye to accept an assignment to create a genealogy. You can do it from fiction if you like. Um, but I want the number of words that you're going to end up using to be divisible by seven. In other words, if you take, well, however, when you finish making your little genealogy, if you count the words and divide by seven, there should be no remainder. Not, in other words, I want you to have your, your assignment a multiple of seven exactly. How many could do that? It's not hard to do, especially in English. You can fudge it around. Okay. Except I got another uh, uh, condition I want you to meet. I want the number of letters that you use, if you count them up, to be div divisible by seven exactly. Now that's a little tougher, isn't it? Because you might get the words to come out, but you need to get the letters to come out. But by fudging around, you could probably do that. Except I, have an, I want the number of vowels and the number of constants each to be a num multiple of seven. How many are still playing with me? <laughs> okay. Well, I've got some additional rules I want your assignment to meet. I want the number of words that begin with a vowel to be divisible by seven. I want the number of words that begin with a consonant to be divisible by seven. And I have some other things. I want the number of words that occur more than once to be a multiple of seven exactly. And I'd like to have those that occur in more than one form to be divisible by seven. And those that are in only one form divisible by seven. How many are still playing? Okay. You realize every time I impose another sevenfold rule, you've got six chances of losing and one of winning just by randomness. You with me? Okay. The number of nouns should be divisible by seven. Only seven words won't be nouns. And the number of names should be divisible by seven. Only seven other kinds of nouns are permitted. Anyone still playing? Okay. And so what you probably, some other things here, the number of male names is divisible by seven, number of generations. And you've probably guessed what I'm doing here. I'm describing to you the genealogy of Jesus Christ in the first 11 verses of the Gospel of Matthew. They meet all those rules. Now you can't imagine doing that yourself. And I'm talking about Greek, which is rigid. Every Greek verb has to meet five conditions. It's much more structured than our English that we're used to. And uh, so the, the, the precision, the, the, what I'm trying to get across is that we discover as you investigate the text, it has properties that are not simulatable. Trying to do that even with the aid of a computer is a ver almost impossible task. See, Greek also is one of the two languages that have a numerical value for every letter in their alphabet. Hebrew and Greek have that peculiar characteristic. That means that every word has a value. They call it the geometrical value. And we could go through this of the rest of chapter 1 and find it still obeys dozens of these sevenfold challenges. I won't go through them all here, but almost every characteristic you measure turns out to be a number that's an exact multiple of seven. Now, the childhood of Christ in Matthew 2, same also fits all of that. And we could go on and on about this. The chances of these things happening by statistical accident are phenomenally Unlikely. If I just have two of these, if I have one uh, rule of seven, you've got six chances of losing, one of winning, right? But if I have two rules, that's one chance in seven squared or 49. In other words, you have 
by randomness, you have one chance in 49 of it coming out the way you want it. You with me? And if I have three of those, it's one chance in 343. See, it's always the, the exponent of the number you're looking at. And so if I have four, it's two, two, it's, you have one chance in 2,400 of getting it by just statistical accident. And so if you go down this list, I've given you nine rules so far. Those nine rules mean that you have one chance in 40 million of having it come out right by just statistical accident. You know, once you understand the, the, the statistical behavior, the more rules there are, the more unlikely it is to come about by anything other than deliberate design. Dr. I, uh, Ivan Panin, born in Russia back in 1955, exi exiled at an early age, he got involved in a plot against the Tsar, emigrated to Germany and then the US. He graduated from Harvard in 1882. And interestingly enough, he discovered Christ. Now, every one of us in this room that has discovered Christ are the result of a miracle. But if you've got a PhD in, from Harvard, that's a bigger miracle. Okay. <laughs> and so, but he also discovered early in his career the, the, what he calls the heptatic structure of the scripture. And back in 1890, actually. He committed the rest of his 50 years of his life uh, generating over 43,000 pages of discoveries very dry reading, but staggering in their implications. Because among other things, it tells you there are all kinds of properties of the Torah that depend on the precise letters that you're using, which tells you not only did God give Moses the Torah, he gave it to Moses letter by letter. You pull one letter out of that and some of those properties start to dissipate. Staggering, staggering implication to an information scientist. And so, but I want to mention just one of these that to me is the most staggering of them all. The New Testament consists of 27 books. That means they, they have a word that starts them and a word that ends them. And if there's 27 books of the New Testament, then you've got uh, 54 words, okay? And so there's a total vocabulary of those words that happened to be 28 words in the Gospels. And uh, so if you go through all this arithmetic, the shortest word, the longest word, all that sort of thing, each one of those are multiple of seven. But here's the one that's interesting to me. The vocabulary in the Gospel of Matthew that is unique to the Gospel of Matthew happens to be a multiple of seven. It occurs 42 times, that's seven times six. It has a 226 letters, that's 7 times 18. And that's un the only property that these words have is that they are unique to the Gospel of Matthew. And they come out precisely as a multiple of 7. You with me so far? My question is, gee, that's interesting. Um, how could that have been organized? Let's imagine that Matthew deliberately tried to make it come out that way. How would you go about doing that? There's only two ways you could do that. One is, you could have all the other authors of the New Testament agree not to use those, those words. How many think that happened? I don't think so. Well, the other way, you could use that argument linguistically to prove that Matthew must have written his last. That's the only way he could preserve that property, right? So I could use that as an argument, at least, that Matthew wrote his document last. Well, that's pretty interesting. So, Gospel of Matthew wrote his last, except I discover that when I look at the Gospel of Mark, it has the same property. That the words that are unique to the Gospel of Mark are a multiple of seven exactly. That proves that Mark was written last. Well, no, wait a minute. If I look at the Gospel of Luke, it also has that property. That the words that are unique to his writing in the New Testament, those words... There's the number of words that are unique to him are a multiple of seven exactly. That proves that Luke wrote his last, except so did John. Each one of these wrote theirs last. In fact, so did James, Peter, Jude, and Paul. Each wrote last. Each one of their writings, the collective writings, has a vocabulary unique to them. Staggering. Staggering. You can't prove the Bible. Yes, you can. So here are these four camps. Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun, 
Reuben, Simeon, and Gad, Ephraim, Manasseh, and Benjamin, Dan, Asher, and Naphtali. We have their numbers. If you add those numbers, you will get the population of each of the four camps. And we're not through yet. What do you, you say, gee, check, what do I do with that? Well, let's back up here. The tabernacle is in the middle of the camp. Around the, ta around the tabernacle, you have the Levites. The Kohathites, Gershonites, Merorites as the three families, but Moses and the priests, which are the core group, on the east side. The east side is, of course, the key side. Now, I have no idea how much space they took to camp. You do understand how hard the rabbis try to keep what they believe the law is saying. They, we often accuse them of splitting hairs. But they try very hard to do what it literally says. We could learn some lessons from them, perhaps. Camp of Judah was instructed to camp east of the Levites. That sounds simple, but it's not. The camp of Reuben was instructed to camp south of the, of the Levites. Well, no problem. This, if you're going to be strictly obedient to the instructions of the Torah, that denies you the opportunity to camp southeast of the uh, tabernacle, of the Levites. Because if you're southeast, you're not east or south. You're in between. And uh, only the cardinal directions are ordained for the t camping. So you have to figure out how wide the Levites are camping and stay within that range if you're going to stay east of the Levites. Do you follow me? Now, and your length then you take proportional to whatever you need for population. So here's the, here are the Levites. The camp of Judah is on the east side. Their symbol is the lion, incidentally, the lion of the tribe of Judah. And so they can camp as wide as the Levites have staked out for themselves. As long, whatever that is, they can, as long as they're east of that, they're obedient. The same thing, likewise, Reuben. His symbol was the man, incidentally. So there again, he, they can camp as wide as the Levites have staked out, no wider, and they take whatever depth they need for their, for their people. If somebody tries to camp between these two, he's neither east nor south, that's verboten. Hmm? So likewise, okay, we have these four zones, southeast, southwest, northwest, northeast, that would be in effect prohibited. Ephraim is on the west side. His symbol was the ox, the symbol of service. And uh, then we have on the north side the tribe of Dan, which ultimately became the eagle was the symbol of the tribe of Dan. And we have the four camps of Israel. Now we add to this the fact that we know what the populations are. We don't know their absolute populations, but we have relative figures. In other words, whatever the number going to war, I think would be reasonably statistically indicative of what the total population is. We have about 186,000 in Judah, 151,000 in uh, Reuben, the camp of Reuben, and we have about 108,000 in the, in the camp of Ephraim, and about 157 uh, in, the, in the camp of Dan. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to embark on a magical helicopter. Outside, I've got parked a special jet ranger, and this one's a very unusual one because it's also a time machine. So we're all going to, in our mind's eye, get in this helicopter, and as we fly over to Israel, we're going to crank it back about, what, 4,000 years? And uh, 3,000 some. And, uh, uh, and we're going to approach the camp of Israel from the east side. And as we approach the camp of Israel, we'll see, of course, right in the center of it, the tabernacle and the Levites. But uh, as we begin to appreciate, this is basically a sketch of the camp of Israel made to scale. I'm using the tribe of, the, the area of, of the Levites as my unit. And uh, whatever that is, um, the length, the proportions of the arms will be proportional to the populations. The largest one is to the east, 186,000 units, say. The shortest one to the, to the west. And the other two nominally about the same. And what do you see there? You can't escape it, can you? This is probably what Balaam saw from the mountains of Moab when he was going to curse Israel. 